thing, which is very textual, uh, is that to be a player character, by definition, you are hopeless in terms of your success in ordinary society. Uh, you can't get along. You can't say, I'm a soldier. No, you were a soldier. You can't get along. And you're never going to make money. You're never going to have a good life. You're never going to, you know, function in society where people do ordinary things. And so your characters uh, must be out there in bad places where reality runs you know, thin or thick, right, chaotic or lawful, uh, in ways that are extraordinarily dangerous to them. And they are um, bringing back loot, ill-gotten or gotten in some way. The system of the game enforces this. You, you get experience from uh, treasure only insofar as you have returned it to ordinary society, and it must have been unowned by humans. I mean, it can't have been money in circulation. It can't have been money that you just found because somebody dropped it. This has to be money that was, uh, there's, there's some technical language actually, it's very clear, I'll paraphrase. It's basically got to be dungeon money. You got to go somewhere that's dangerous and there's got to be something that didn't want you to have it and you had to do something about it to get it, period. And you have to bring it back. You have to make use of it. It's just having it, you know, oh, I got, the, I got the bag of gold off the troll's body. I guess I have this many experience. No, you don't. You got a job to do now. You got to get that stuff back there. So... This is kind of an interesting point. Uh, you can do things with the money, particularly for magic users and clerics, in terms of, for example, building laboratories and temples and workshops and stuff like that. But you are still not going to function in society. I mean, shoot, go back there, found an academy, you know, get a wizardly workshop going, you know, charge tuition, do all that stuff. You can't get away with it. It's not going to work. You, your character, can't do it you're gonna fuck it up so before you do if you want that sort of thing get out you know get let your assistant run the place and go off where you're good at things which is basically staring down the jaws of death and you know finding loot that everybody else has forgotten about because that's all you're good for so this is real interesting in terms of ottoman stuff for two reasons one is that for a great deal of the areas you know, called the Ottoman Empire, um, they uh, are often way more civilized than the burgs and municipalities and whatnot over there in Europe. Uh, the technology is better. The literacy, the food, the you know, all sorts of things, the legal processes, the, if you will, the fabric of society, all that stuff is just far more functional. And interestingly enough, to a modern reader, you know, you read about it and you're kind of like, well, this is sort of reads like, you know, society. And it, it kind of does. So um, it in a way, it's kind of ramping it up to 11. It's like, how can you be a Lamentations of the Flame Princess character in this you know, it's, it's really a functioning society here. And the answer is, well, yeah, then that means we got to look for those places where you're going to be able to do this um, without being, you know, an instant threat to life and limb to people who have every reason to do away with you properly, as well they should, considering what a psycho you are. So, um you, uh, you find yourself in kind of an interesting situation as a player character or as a designer of the setting, too, saying, hmm, we have to make that, you know, optional, you know, an, an option. So uh, I, I did some hunting around and found, if you will, the trouble spots of Empire, uh, where uh, a, a, a small L lawless person... Uh, can go and hook himself or herself some loot and be able to get back and, and use it. Um, there are some very, very interesting ones. My favorite so far are uh, the Sea of Azov, which is that little body of water, you know, um, at the, the north tip of 
the Black Sea, and you may wonder, you know, Crimean, Crimean Peninsula in what? And the answer is there, between the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea proper. And it is just rife with pilots, uh, excuse me, what am I saying, pilots? Pirates, um, and all sorts of transport of important um, textiles and lumber and stuff like that. It's, it's actually a very rich area in terms of product. Um, it's also really, really interesting because during the period, the whole period we're talking about, like the centuries surrounding 1630, uh, the status of some of the regions shift back and forth. They're part of the empire as a province, but no, they're, they're a province that's actually paid by the empire rather than paying taxes, or no, they're uh, part of, you know, of, of Russia um, or not. Uh, or they're basically a bunch of people who are saying, you know, screw you to anybody who says what they're a part of. So it's a, it's a great place, right, to go off. And, 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 and there's all the controversies today about the nature of the slave trade across that very sea, whether it even happened or happened to what extent and by whom, for whom, and so on. And tempers run hot today on that topic. And that's great. Perfect. I mean, it's Let's play there. So uh, another one is occupied Baghdad, which is right in 1630, right square in the middle of uh, the final Persian occupation of that region in the course of, again, you know, century plus long war between the Ottoman Empire and the Safavid Empire. And the, uh, the, the takeover of Baghdad right then is a big deal. I mean, the Grand Viziers are running head first one after the other into these enormous policy problems and um and they're they're you know turning over practically one a year and they often end up in uh you know coming to sticky ends and the inability to take baghdad during this period is a big deal um this is also the period of this what's called the sultanate of women uh during which the uh succession of sultans is a lot of young and or ineffective people um, and that the uh, the so-called harem uh, is uh, an enormous force political policy making force the mother of the current sultan is uh, extremely famous and is basically you know being the sultan through a great deal of this the power players are uh, the, the the queen sultan and the when well, she's the mom not the wife and then you have um the grand vizier but as i say the grand vizier position which is kind of like the prime minister he's, you know he's especially of a kind of a military bent and that that position is not anything anybody seems to want although people seem to want it real bad but i keep wondering why because you know they keep running into another impossible war situation and if things don't bounce their way, then, you know, out they go, and sometimes not so nicely. So um, there's that. And then there is the head eunuch. Uh, there are actually two sets of eunuchs, and they're called the white eunuchs and the black eunuchs. And the, 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 the chief black eunuch is a super-duper badass at this point, and is also, rather than just sort of taking charge of the palace, women and you know stuff like that the things you think of no no this guy's a general and is completely you know a, a hardcore badass in terms of policy making and a presence in constantinople you'll notice i don't say istanbul the city was not called istanbul until the 20th century so yes uh, we talk about the turks taking constantinople well they kept the name so uh, they used the greek name actually Constantinopolis so that's the name of the city um, I wouldn't really put play there um, but I think the context of all these things just kind of ripples outward in a hundred different ways and sets up great adventure scenarios anyways uh, that's a bit about this and I hope you enjoyed it to learn what I'm doing it's a you know a quick look at the Empire a look at the magic stuff because I'm redoing the clerics, just writing the cleric stuff just from the ground up all over.
totally different in lots of ways. And, um, oh, there's just so much more to talk about, too. Um, I was really looking forward to uh, Ottoman magic and looking forward to what it was like and reading up on it and saying, what on earth did they think of, you know, occultist stuff? And what is that? And lo and behold, I saw D&D &D looking back at me. And there's a reason for that. So all the times that uh, we you, you look at uh, magic and you say, this is not really fitting with knights in plate mail over in medieval France. Now, is it? And you're right. It's not. Uh, and you're saying, you know, this is, you know, made up. He must have got it from Jack Vance. You know, he must have got it from fantasy. It's, you know, it, it doesn't look like Tolkien at all, certainly, because it doesn't. And now I'm looking at this occultism and I'm going, I'm reading about, you know, you're reading the words off the piece of paper and the paper bursts into flame and you're inscribing, you're drawing the circle to summon the demon in and all this stuff. It's all from here. The Brits lifted it in the 19th century and that deeply informed 20th century fantasy written by American and British authors. And that's where D, D gets it from so i'm kind of getting back to the main vein when it comes to D, &D magic and uh turning up the heat on all of its nuances so that's fun too all right then here is uh first session at kind of an attempt at once my sort of rules tweakiness and setting summaries and stuff like that are getting into a usable draft form